many people sort of who are criminal defense attorneys or who see themselves as, as progressives know that colorblindness has been used as, as a wedge politically often, and we know that it's something that has been manipulated by people uh, to, you know, to, to sort of mask issues of racial disproportionality. But even the, those of us who intellectually know that, that this aspiration, this vision of racial justice as presuming that what ending discrimination requires is equal individual treatment without regard to race or ethnicity or colorblindness, even those, who, those of us who know that intellectually colorblindness isn't the goal sometimes still think, but I don't treat people differently based upon race or ethnicity. So it can be still a challenge not to think of that as the goal, to think of that's what but fairness means. But what colorblindness looks like in practice is often kind of the opposite. Because what colorblindness often translates into is, in, particularly in workplaces, are standards of behavior and norms set by the racially dominant group. The expectation in the workplace that employees are supposed to downplay their ra racial or ethnic differences and sort of be like everybody else, and that people of color should somehow adopt or change. That's what colorblindness often translates into in practice. And there was a, a series of studies done about what colorblind workplaces are like for people of color, and they're deeply dispiriting studies because, again, the colorblindness aspiration as practice is the opposite. So in workplaces where people adhere to the idea I should see people uh, without regard to race or ethnicity, what results is more social distancing, meaning people interact less with people who are other races and ethnicities than their own, uh, perhaps because there's this notion that, you know, sort of, I should not see this, uh, race or ethnicity, and yet I'm more comfortable with people who are just like me. Colorblind workplaces have more justifications for any inequality. Well, so all the people in charge are one race or ethnicity? Well, just, just the way it is. We treat people as individuals. Uh, in, ex there's a lower level of engagement among employees of color in colorblind workplaces. And this is in part because white employees are less likely to recognize what we call microaggressions if the presumption is that everyone's being seen and treated equally. So what's a microaggression? It's this kind of question. So like, what are you? what? Now, is that ever asked of someone who's white appearing? Almost never. It's almost invariably asked of someone who is of, who appears to be perhaps not uh, basically white. And it's the kind of comment that's like, oh, so, and this actually, Alexis has uh, experiences this fairly often. She went to Princeton and Yale. She has the most, the, kind of the fanciest and most impressive resume you've ever seen. And yet after a presentation, sometimes someone will say, Alexis is really articulate. You'd be like, yeah, she's insanely eloquent and brilliant. And why is the statement made with a weird up tilt at the end? So it's, again, this articulate, which sometimes those of us who are white just think of as a compliment, ends up being received reasonably as a very strange stereotype hidden in a compliment. And so we call this a microaggression. So part of what also leads to colorblindness being difficult and in, in sort of uh, inexperienced, kind of contrary to the goals, is what we call racial anxiety, or what social scientists call racial anxiety, which is the anxiety people often experience in cross-group interactions. And it's experienced differently depending upon our race or ethnicity. So if we're a person of color, the fear or worry might be that we'll experience discrimination, hostile treatment, or invalidation. And all of the research we just saw showed why people might feel that way. Those of us who are white often feel racial anxiety because we're worried, frankly, that what we say or do will make us seem racist. As Alexis said, there's this you know, strong association of immorality with being racist, and so we would think that trying to you know, not be racist would be good, but the problem is when we're experiencing racial anxiety, it's literally our stress, stress levels going up, we're cognitively in this confused place, and so the way racial anxiety shows up is shorter interactions, cognitive fatigue, our brain gets tired, avoidance, who wants to be in a place where you're anxious, and awkward attempts to connect. So I, I always give examples from experiences that I've had. Um, one recent one that seems to come up a lot is, you know, white uh, supervisor comes in and sees the person of color he or she's working with and says, really excited, I just saw hidden figures. 
and like wants to get a pat on the head or something. And this is not a person who regularly discusses movies with people. So I, I did, gave this example recently at a conference, and the woman who invited me to the conference, who was a, an African American woman, came up to me just cracking up afterward, and she said, that's exactly what my supervisor, who was sitting next to me, did last week. <laughs> and, and he had exactly the same expression on his face that you did. So he was a little embarrassed. Uh, the other example is, I really like kimchi. Well, again, who cares? If it's not someone with whom you regularly talk about food, why are, you know, why are these words coming out? Because as a white person feeling some anxiety, I want to connect. But there's this, again, not, I'm not certain how to do so. And the end result, of course, confirms everyone's fear. So the person of color is feeling like, why is my employer you know, sort of interacting with me so oddly and obviously focused on my race? And for the white person, it's like, they really don't like me. And so everyone walks away disappointed. Um, so racial anxiety is not the goal. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit more because racial anxiety has this sort of powerful effect in interactions particularly in contexts that, of course, are salient and important. So this was a study done uh, on college campuses to identify whether people's goals are different cross race. And so the question was asked of college students, uh, what was more important in initial interaction, to be liked or respected? For most of the white college students, what they reported uh, was that they wanted to be liked. And we've actually done this in large groups. Do you want to be liked or respected? And the white people say, I want to be liked. And what, we, what the researchers realized is that most middle class and you know, sort of educated white people, we presume that we're respected. So then we focus on wanting to be liked. The reason I mentioned class is because if you are poor and white, you often don't presume respect, particularly from someone who you perceive as being more educated than you, who you fear has contempt for you. But if you're middle class, you kind of presume respect, so your goal is to be liked. For, in this study, and in many studies like it, for African Americans and Latinos, the level of class or educational accomplishment is irrelevant. The presumptions of respect are not present because they've rarely been afforded. And therefore, the respect has to be sort of accorded before the question of being liked is even relevant. And when this becomes a problem is in an initial interaction. In an interview, for example, you know, if the white person's like, so what summer camp did you go to? And did you see hidden figures? And the person of color in the interview is thinking, can we talk about my job qualifications? And of course, the white person tries even harder and becomes even more ingratiating, as the study shows. And the person of color becomes more serious, seeking to find that respect. And both people walk away with their fears confirmed. And of course, if the white person is the person in power, I just don't think he's going to be a good fit. He seems like he'd be someone difficult to work with. And in context involving client interaction, when I've talked to people who are in criminal defense, or when I've talked to people who are in, uh, in, in family court and doing work uh, in these contexts, this issue has been deeply significant. So when people are being honest, many of the uh, white attorneys have said, when they hear about this study, this is what I do. I'm trying to make my clients feel comfortable, and so I act very informal. And it never occurred to me that acting informal might seem disrespectful, but it actually makes a lot of sense. And so thinking about how your attempts to connect are landing, and again, focusing on how the other person's experiencing it, rather than on how we're being perceived, is absolutely crucial. So another sort of similar uh, variation of this is how we perceive discrimination. This was another study done on college campuses, and what was being measured was the different reactions to ambiguous versus blatant discrimination. So what you had are three scenarios, hiring scenarios, one involving uh, the person who's most qualified being hired, that's the control, that's in blue. The other involving a case of blatant discrimination where a less qualified white person is hired over a more qualified person of color, and the person who did the hiring decision in the scenario says that person belonged to too many minority organizations. Blatant discrimination. As you can see in red, for those of us who are white, blatant discrimination is often extremely surprising because it's inconsistent with our worldview. So the cognitive interference, which was the measure that was being assessed, the whites have a great deal of cognitive interference with blatant discrimination. The black college students obviously thought it was wrong, but they didn't show the same level of cognitive interference because, frankly, there's a place in their brain for discrimination that is very clear. 
The difference was when it was ambiguous. So in the scenario, it involved a hiring decision, similarly with the person with the, you know, fewer, the lower qualifications according to the criteria being hired who was white. But the explanation was, well, this, you know, this other person had a great GPA, but he didn't take any business classes. That wasn't a criteria. But for those white college students, that seemed like a reasonable explanation for choosing one person over another. It was ambiguous. So the instinct is to give the benefit of the doubt, not have any cognitive interference at all. That wasn't discrimination. For the black students in the study, this led to extreme cognitive interference. Two questions. Was it race? Seems like it. If I say something, will I be believed? Or will I be accused of being oversensitive and playing, quote unquote, the race card? It's a double level of cognitive interference. And if we think about the experience is in most sort of progressive workplaces or in most institutions in which most people are you know, sort of consciously egalitarian, the ambiguous discrimination is happening all the time. And so the cognitive interference, the cognitive burden is being borne by folks of color and those who are white are just walking blithely along assuming everything is just fine. So what can be done about this? And now we're bringing it to the both context of client interactions and also the workplace. So what can be done is to, in institutions, create a sense of institutional belonging. And there's you know, sort of various ways of doing that, and every institution will have to think about what's an impediment to that. We did some work with an organization recently where there were very few lawyers of color. Many of the people of color in the institution were, uh, were administrative staff. And what the lawyers of color identified as a real challenge was whenever they had office parties, the staff of color were expected to clean up. Now, the lawyers of color all helped clean up, but the white attorneys didn't. And so it really felt symbolically distressing and as though there was something problematic about the workplace. Now, the good thing is this was a group that was able to sort of talk through this and resolve it. And one of the questions becomes, how do you identify what the barriers to people feeling like they belong? What are the, way, what are the kinds of ambiguous discrimination uh, that are occurring in ways that make sense? And visuals matter. So again, with respect to if when clients are coming into the office, the visuals in the office will make a difference. If it feels like there are positive representations of groups, that will matter. Positive priming. This sounds incredibly cliched to say that thinking of happy things makes you happy but actually it really does work. And with respect to cross-racial interactions, it's actually a very powerful tool. Because what we're talking about here is, before you're gonna have a consequential cross-group interaction, thinking of a previous interaction that went really well actually brings you into the space with a more positive, uh, essentially with a more positive countenance. And so the person receives you as you, know, you seem confident, you seem kind of happy to see them, the racial anxiety actually diminishes on both sides. So this, again, can actually be a very powerful tool. The most powerful tool, the most critical tool, again, for really consequential interactions are actually called scripts. And obviously we're not talking about having a piece of paper that you read when you interact with someone, that would be weird. Um, but knowing in an initial you know, client interview or knowing an initial uh, encounter with someone the ways that you're going to accord respect, the way you're going to sequence the interaction can actually be very helpful because if you know how you're going to sequence, then your racial anxiety is reduced on both sides. And this has actually been tested in police departments by Phil Goff, who identified racial anxiety, police worry about being uh, perceived as racist, as actually correlated with excessive use of force among police officers, which seems counterintuitive, but if you think about the powers that police have, they have two sources of authority, moral and physical. A police officer who's worried about being perceived as racist doesn't necessarily trust that the person he's interacting with sees him as moral and may even question his own kind of morality in that context. But if the police officer is taught what Phil teaches, which is essentially a set of steps for non-racist policing, then the police officer goes into the encounter with a sense of confidence and calm, and that actually makes it less likely that force will be used. So thinking about the sequence, again, in an initial client interaction or in other, in with, talking with a family member, other areas where racial anxiety could be a problem, it can really be helpful. Finally, and this is a, this is a tough uh, issue to talk about because it involves what effect it has when we know that there are stereotypes about our group.
What effect, what power can that have? And it turns out to be extremely consequential. Most of us, in fact all of us, know the negative stereotypes about our groups. We know them better than anybody else. And in fact, we're often aware, if we're in certain settings, that people might be holding those stereotypes, or we might fear that. And that's what stereotype threat is. When a negative stereotype about us is triggered, it can undermine our ability to perform. A lot of this work has been done in the academic context. So if, and this is actually interesting, if an Asian American woman is taking a math test, if she's asked to check her gender, she will do less well on that math test than if she's asked to check her ethnicity because different identities are being triggered. What about in criminal justice? How is this relevant? In potentially two ways. It can be relevant for the client who may be worried that a negative stereotype is being triggered about him, and this has been seen in recent healthcare research, because stereotype threat is a physiological response. If we're worried about a stereotype about our group, our, it's not just being nervous or choking. It's our heart rate increasing, our blood pressure rising, our brain diverts cognitive resource from the task at hand into managing the stress that's associated with those stereotypes. You know, we self-monitor and try and suppress doubts. We often will focus on disproving our group's negative reputation. Sometimes in a work context, we'll go out of our way to do challenging tasks because we don't want to sort of risk confirming negative stereotypes. But what happens in certain contexts, and this is another work scenario, is in, for, for those of us, again, this is another peril of the white liberal. For those of us who are white, often an effect of worrying that we might be seen as racist can result in our engaging in certain behavior that's actually exactly the opposite of what is valuable and useful. So white middle school teachers who were given um, uh, essays, intentionally badly written essays, and were asked to give feedback on those essays were found to give less critical, appropriate feedback to black and Latino students than they did to white students, except when they were in schools where they felt supported by the institution, this is really kind of interesting, they gave the same level of appropriate critical feedback to the black students, but still not to the Latino students, telling us that two different phenomena are going on. With the Latino students, it's implicit bias, right? They have lower expectations or, or lower uh, presumptions of the ability to be effective writers of middle school essays. But with the black students, when they feel supported, when they feel like their principals got you know, backing them, when they feel like their colleagues support them, they give appropriate critical feedback to the black students because the reason they didn't before is because they're worried about seeming racist. They don't want to say negative things. And when we've talked with criminal defense lawyers across the country, one of the things we hear repeatedly is that white supervisors never give any feedback. And so what's that about? Likely, it may well be, I'm not sure how to give critical feedback, so I'm just not going to. And as lawyers, we know that we need critical feedback in order to actually grow as lawyers and be effective. And not getting critical feedback or being given inflated praise, frankly, feels deeply condescending. And it can lead to more disengagement and be harder emotionally, frankly, to deal with, even than straight on bias sometimes. Because if someone's biased, then frankly, you can write them off. But if someone's really nice and not giving you the appropriate feedback, then you're not sure what to do with them. So what about clients and the risk that knowledge of stereotypes may affect clients in their interactions with you as a lawyer? I'm going to draw from the healthcare research because this is a new line of research in healthcare that's potentially extremely relevant. It turns out that healthcare, and it's not surprising, patients are very aware of the negative stereotypes that healthcare providers may have about them. So this is an example in a qualitative study of a Mexican-American patient talking about the prejudice. You know, I think there's some kind of prejudice of the name. There's a lack of respect. They think they can get away with a lot because, in quotes, here's another dumb Mexican. So this is this man's perception of what healthcare providers think about him. What's the effect in the healthcare research of, of people's awareness of the stereotypes held about them? Avoidance of healthcare, impaired communications with healthcare providers, poor adherence to treatment plans, discounting feedback, elevated blood sugar levels, negative effects of smoking, ultimately disidentification viewing health promotion behaviors as white. So I'm going to ask you to replace healthcare with criminal defense and think about avoidance of interacting with your lawyer, impaired communication with your lawyer, poor adherence to what your lawyer recommends that you do, discounting feedback that your lawyer gives you, 
disidentification with the whole criminal justice system. This hasn't been studied yet, but it's a study we're hoping to do at Perception because understanding the effect on clients of the worry that stereotypes are being held about them, even by their own lawyers, we know is consequential. So what can be done? For stereotype threat, just like racial anxiety, creating an identity safe environment is crucial. Increasing the feeling of social belonging. And, and when I'm talking about stereotype threat here, we're now sort of talking both about the significance of stereotype threat potentially for lawyers of color in predominantly white environments and potentially for clients of color in cross-racial interactions. So again, for lawyers of color in predominantly white environments, social belonging can be really crucial. Feeling valued and feeling as though people see you as, again, an important critical member of the team and not someone who's gonna be condescended to. Um, removing triggers for stereotype threat. When we talk about triggers, among the triggers for stereotype threat are being reminded of the negative stereotypes about our group. And that can be tough because thinking about a lot of the work that we do in the criminal justice civil rights context, we're often lifting up disparities all the time. I don't know how many of you remember when it used to be said with great frequency that there are more black men in prison than in college. That was completely wrong when it was said and it's obviously completely wrong now by a factor of 800,000. And yet it's the kind of thing that people will say thinking that we're creating moral urgency around the issue of mass incarceration. But if we're actually exaggerating the, uh, the, the level of criminality of a group of concern, we're hurting the members of that community. We're hurting that, that group. And there's been studies showing that being told, you know, this litany of negative disparities about your group results in cognitive interference, more difficulty, and less task motivation. So we have to be really conscious of how we balance. Yes, we have to be aware of the disparities. Yes, we have to do work to correct for them, but we can't constantly only create these deficit frames. The asset frame is really important. And the growth mindset idea, the idea that things can get better is crucial. So one of the tools, and I'm gonna end, I promise, and we'll actually have a little bit of chance to have Q&A. One of the tools, both in the workplace and potentially as a, as a client uh, engagement, is called wise feedback. And uh, Claude Steele, who's done most of the work on stereotype threat with Jeff Cohen, identified this in the mid-90s in the educational context, but it's being tried in other contexts. And so what it would look like if we were to apply it in a work context or potentially in a client context would be first to work with your client or colleague to identify what is your highest goal and aspiration, to think in kind of high, in terms of high expectations. Using an asset frame, what are the strengths, real strengths, specific strengths, not generalities of praise about that person that suggests they can meet these aspirations. Identify those so you're in the position where you're sort of incentivized to look for people's strengths and not constantly emphasize or only think about their, their weaknesses. Identify the strengths and the assets and convey them. Again, not in a condescending, oh, you're so articulate way, but in a, you know, I've noticed that you have several areas of strength. Again, if it's a lawyer, you know, the way you, you know, so you, you identify analytic issues is, is you know, is, is, the way, is exceptional and here's some examples of that. So again, it doesn't feel, uh, it doesn't feel condescending. And critically, candidly share uh, the constructive feedback on the steps the person needs to actually grow and meet those expectations. So this is the way this played out in the initial study that was done. When white students and black students at Stanford were asked to write an essay and then were, and they had to submit a picture because it was gonna be in a publication so they knew the person would know their race or ethnicity, they were given feedback either pure criticism, and as you can see from this uh, graph, in terms of the motivation to complete the task, when the black students were given just criticism, there was very low motivation to complete the task. And we only need to think about Tom Meyer to understand why. There was the fear if you're just getting criticism, this criticism is biased. This person is seeing, you know, sort of weakness and not able to see my strengths. Why should I believe it? Praise with the critical feedback helps. But what's really significant is having this wise feedback, invocation of high expectations, specific recognition of what suggests the person can meet those expectations, and then the critical feedback, the uh, motivation to complete tasks for the black students exceeds that of white students. 
Now what's interesting in that previous study is the white students actually had lower motivation with the high expectations and the, the assurance of the ability to meet them, in part probably because for the white students there was no reason to question the initial negative criticism, right? Those of us who are white don't presume that our race has anything to do with someone's feedback to us. In a more recent study, uh, there's actually increases and, and, and more positive outcomes in the actual success of completing a task for both white and students, but you can see what's most significant is the difference between how black students scored on a revised essay, a revised essay when they were given just criticism compared to how they scored when they were given invocation of high standards, assurance of the ability to meet those standards, and the critical feedback. It's a powerful difference, and it, thinking about how this applies in the context of client feedback, there's some potential, hopefully, for, again, it to be a, me a method to convey respect and a way to engage in a dialogue that's really positive. So thank you all very much. Um, We do still have 10 minutes, and I really, really would love if people have some questions. I know that was an extraordinary amount of information to just like pour upon you with no break. Um, but if people w do have some questions, suggestions, challenges, you know, have a few moments to engage, that would be fantastic, both for people in this room, hopefully, and for anyone who's listening. So would love to get some challenges or questions if people have them. Yes. Rachel, have you done any work with uh, respect to uh, voir dire juries with respect to race issues? Um, that's obviously a big issue, and, and my experience has been every trial is about race. You know, in, in many cases, the only person of color in the room is the defendant. And, you know, if I'm that defendant and I walk into that room, everybody else in there is white but me, and I'm on trial, that kind of would make me really nervous. Um, and obviously, getting the right jury would be a, uh, uh, you know, for a fair trial would be important. Have you done any work in that respect? So first of all, you're exactly right that whenever there's a case in, with a uh, criminal defendant who is of a group stereotypically associated with a particular kind of crime, it's a case about race. And you're also right in your instinct that in some ways those cases are even more dangerous than those cases in which race is expressly salient. And there was a, a juror study done involving two hypotheticals. One, you know, and they have a, a, a white male, black female couple, man hits the woman, she, you know, she's hurt, it's an assault. Another one, black man, white woman, he hits the woman, it's an assault. And then there was the, the other uh, scenario was same thing, uh, white man, black woman, black man, white woman. The only thing that changes is the man says either um, I can, you, know, you can't treat a white man like that in public or you tr can't treat a black man like that in public. And the question would be, and the question in the test was, in any of those instances, did white jurors treat the black defendant differently? And before I did this work, I would have thought that the scenario where the black man said, how dare you treat a black man like this in public, would have led to a harsher response by a white juror to the black man. But it didn't. It's the opposite. It's when race is there, but it's not salient, it's not express, that actually the white jurors are harsher toward the black defendant. And the reason posited for that by the study, and this is Sam Summers, is because in the instance in which race is salient, people are on notice that they need to be fair and that there's a risk. And it, you know, again, so as long as you have people who are generally in a place where they want to be fair, if they're on notice that there's risk, they can override the bias. But in the case where race is present but not salient, that's when implicit biases come into play and that's where the harshness uh, the, the overly uh, harsh uh, outcomes can occur. So what you're saying is exactly right, that what you have to figure out how to do with a predominantly white jury pool when the, pers when the case has a uh, defendant of color but race is not express, is find a way to invoke the aspiration to fairness and the risk that people might not be fair without out and out calling them racist. Because we know what happens if we just you know, sort of throw out that we think they're racist, they get really defensive, and that leads to, you know, sort of a, a negative doubling down. So that what's been shown to be effective is invoking this aspiration of fairness and conveying your confidence that they will be fair.
And that's something that the lawyer can do and can do very effectively. And what's, what, else, what's el, what else is being tested right now are implicit bias jury instructions. So in Seattle federal court, there's a test, you know, there's some implicit bias jury instructions that are out there. They're being tested. They haven't been tested yet, so I can't tell you whether or not they're going to be effective. But for the, 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 and I'm sure, again, I can, the trial lawyers among you will know that the lawyer's body language toward the defendant, of course, matters. And the degree to which there's a confident comfort level and a sort of humanization of the client in ways that, that are real and authentic, that will communicate itself. But creating that aspiration to be fair has been found to be very powerful in jury studies. Yes? Somewhat as a follow-up to what you just uh, answered, is there any uh, data to suggest what is more favorable um, to the standard, somewhat standard instruction in federal court, that is, so-and-so, the defendant here, happens to be of a particular race or gender, um, you cannot factor that into your deliberations. Um, There's it, every reason to believe that does absolutely no work. Because <laughs> um, again, that's basically just telling people to suppress. And so that's not doing the work of creating the aspiration and the invocation of I know you're the good person who of course would be fair, that's telling people not to uh, take race into effect. And again, all the research suggests that's unlikely to do the work we want it to accomplish. And perhaps even further, more of an insulting? Potentially, it's, it's insulting and backfires. So again, I would be wary. Uh, we, we're, we're actually hoping to work with the uh, Connecticut uh, Supreme Court to test the, jur the implicit bias jury instructions that are being used in Seattle, federal court actually, and we'll certainly report to this group and everyone else the results of tests after we fin finish them. Now, in discussion of the implicit bias, your presentation was primarily um, from the, the actor part. In other words, I as the attorney. Now, I as a black attorney, I see implicit bias coming towards me. Right, and that's not just from um, the the judiciary. Sometimes, not often, but sometimes, clients, family members, and so the question is, how does how do I, as a black lawyer, deal with the implicit bias that's coming towards me? So, if I can ask a, a question, in terms of there's it seems like there's two elements to your question that are really important. One is. Are you asking for sort of steps to overcome the biases that are That's number one. okay? So number one is is steps toward overcoming someone else's implicit biases about you. I, I, what we're trying to emphasize and where we're trying to identify work and potentially do some work is also what tools can be shared with people of color on the receiving end of bias so that the sort of weight of that bias doesn't become too profound, so resilience tools. So I don't know if you were asking for that as well. well yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of, first of all, you have to recognize it. it. it's there, right? And then secondly, you know, what are the tools that help you overcome it? And then thirdly, as you just mentioned, you know, how do you bear it once it's there? So in terms of the, so it, it is, it has been shown to be obviously helpful if we are able to be aware of the biases that may exist against us and be able to detach them from us. Because the, one of the risks with just the subliminal recognition of implicit biases against us is that it'll t trigger our own stereotype threat. I've certainly had this experience myself on a class level where I come from a working class background and again, I'm Irish. And so in interacting with someone who's you know, high wasp, I feel like they're looking at me with contempt. And I ha have had the experience of having to really work hard to not let that depress my ability to perform and to, be, and to be effective. Being aware of that phenomena, that someone might be biased against me, and might truly be biased against me in the way that they're treating me, being aware in a sense and to be able to detach from it can be both helpful in, assure, in, in, a, in uh, ensuring that I can perform to my capacity, which often does, if it's implicit and not explicit bias, overcome the bias. Right, because again, we're, we want to be careful to ex to distinguish between someone who actually does hold explicit biases. None of my tools are helpful for that person. Right, that's another. That's a whole another conversation. But if we're talking about people who generally, who, who who your sense is, this person wants to be fair. They want to be a good person, but they've got some biases, and I can see them. They're standing away from me a little bit. They're acting. Like, first of all, it might be racial anxiety that they're fearing, that they're experiencing, and so there is a, there's actually potentially quite a bit of power in that's often unrecognized 
when you're the person in the non-dominant group if essentially you know what that person's experiencing and they don't? Because you can sort of, I'll give one example. If you're, if you're in a context in which it's white liberals you're dealing with, we are desperate for people of color to like us. <laughs> we, we, white people here, come on, we are. And, and I'm, I'm serious. And so it's a power that, that people should, <laughs> except Brendan, except Brendan, he doesn't care. No, but for, for, mo, for a lot of white liberals, the, 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 what looks like implicit bias may be that, but it may also and maybe particularly be racial anxiety. So the person's acting weird because they're anxious. And so that actually does potentially give the person of color some power to be able to sort of take the step of essentially saying, it's OK. Desensitizing, <laughs> De desensitizing the moment and using essentially your power to convey to them, I think you're a good person. It can be unbelievably powerful. John Powell, who some of you may know his work, he can go into a room full of people, in, white people in any place in the country, and just by looking at them with his expectation that they want to be good people, they all desperately want to please him. We did a workshop with prosecutors in the South, where after it was over, the person who invited us there said, uh, Rachel, you, know, you and your colleague were, were good. I've got a man crush on John. And it was, it, it was in large part because for him as a, as a you know, sort of 50-year-old white Republican male, to have this African-American man think of him as a potentially good person was, it, it was actually very meaningful to him. So that's a power that you can actually sometimes exercise if it's implicit or racial anxiety as opposed to explicit. With respect to the resilience tools, just, uh, just sat on a dissertation committee where there's some powerful work showing that people who've experienced trauma often you know, carry the sort of continuing effects of trauma with them, not surprisingly, and it can be kind of a, through a rumination and a constant remembering of what that experience was like, and it can be very burdensome to carry that. And this, again, it sounds very simple, but it turns out that having people write the facts of what happened, but more importantly, express in writing the emotions associated with that trauma has been shown to settle their stress levels a great deal and to increase, in feeling, increase feelings of well-being. So the study that was just completed, and it was across three different iterations, was whether or not that would be helpful for people on the receiving end of discrimination. And it was found to actually be very powerful. And it was interesting as a lawyer to read about this tool, because as lawyers, often our instinct is, just tell us the facts. And we want to put emotion to the side. And we think people should be able to distance themselves from their emotions. But it turns out that having people suppress those emotions in the context of discrimination means that the emotions stay very salient and they continue to be harmful. So to the extent someone's on the receiving end of discrimination and you're working with them or supporting them or it's you, actually writing it down and writing the feelings that were accompanied the experience can actually settle the feeling and again create a, a developing sense of, of resilience. Yes. So throughout the presentation, and actually um, sort of piggybacking off of what one of your responses was to his question, you know, talking about carrying the weight of bias and how that ultimately affects us. I mean, as a female attorney of color, one of my concerns, or I guess one of my struggles, is always honoring the revolutionary in me, right? Wanting to wear my hair the way it grows out of my head, wanting to dress in a certain way that is a reflection of who I am, but a fear of how that will ultimately affect how the judges receive my legal arguments, how my colleagues in a profession receive you know, what I have to say. But I feel like, why should I have to? And, I, and, and even you know, what you just said about being in a room full of people and tr I guess dissipating whatever their anxiety is, I don't want to have to do that. I'm sorry you're concerned about your interaction with me, but why do I have to carry you know, what it is you're feeling. Why do I have to say, oh, I don't think you're racist. Oh, I think you're okay. And sometimes I feel like, you know, there's not enough attention paid to, or there's not enough that addresses sort of what that feels like to constantly have to think about what you say and what you do and the ultimate impact. Now, don't get me wrong. Obviously, as a public defender, 
I signed up to do that. When I walk into a courtroom, I signed up and I clocked in to, you know, be the voice of other individuals. But I also feel like, you know, no one thinks about, you know, what it is for me to have to wake up an extra 30 minutes to tie my hair back to make a, to make sure a judge receives my legal argument the way I need it to land so it doesn't ultimately affect my client or that I don't say the wrong thing to a prosecutor or at a presentation that make the white people feel uncomfortable. So first of all, <laughs> you're, you're abs everything you said, as I hope you know, is absolutely right. And, and then, the, the most significant part of the work that perception is trying to do, frankly, is to put, is to begin to have those of us who are white do far more of the racial navigation than we ever do. Because right now we're putting that entire burden, for the most part, on our colleagues of color and it's not fair. And so when we share this material to a room full of judges, it's exactly what we say. You know, do you understand that when you respond to lawyers of color in this way, that is putting a burden on them that they should not bear? And do you understand that it matters whether you look at the lawyer of color with as much respect as you do the white male lawyer? And you know, oftentimes when I give these presentations with judges, uh, there's a, a wonderful uh, judge uh, from the Bronx, Judge Roberts, who will tell, okay, so, <laughs> Uh, Judge Roberts will tell, you know, will t share the experience of being, you know, a young prosecutor and coming in and having, you know, being assumed not to be the lawyer, despite being the most elegant woman I've ever seen in my life. So again, part of the work that we're trying to do, and frankly, you know, I didn't say this at the outset, but I often do. Like, why is this white lady up here talking about this? Like, what's her deal? Part of the reason that we have an organization, and this a lot of it's led by John, have an organization that has ideally people of different races and ethnicities doing this work and presenting it together is we're trying to create an idea of what it should be, which is I should be standing up here doing more of this work. It shouldn't all have to be on people of color. And, and absolutely, I 100% don't want to have, it be, have you hear me to say what you should do is that racial navigation because that would so not be my place, or that you should soften your words for me. Um, the, the, again, the goal is for the institutions to change so that you don't have to, because people of color have been having to do that work for far too long, and that's the critique of colorblindness. But in the meantime, as you just indicated, to the extent that there are tools that you may be able to use that are empowering, we feel like we should have to share those at the same time. So the primary goal is the institutions should change. The primary goal is those of us who are white should be doing far more of the navigation, knowing this is a, you know, a multi-dimensional protracted struggle, as my roofer father would say. We share you know, all the tools in our arsenal. But thank you so much for raising what you did. I was just really going to piggyback off of what she said, because as hard as it is, then it feels like almost your whole identity is just gone. It's eviscerated because if I say the wrong thing, then I have an attitude. And instead of me having an actual personality, I now become whatever your derogatory stereotype is. And that affects me in ways people could never know and never understand. I will lose jobs, be locked out of opportunities, not that we're not even worried about being not received by a judge. I'll never even get to see him because, and I could be, the, I could exhibit the best character. I could be the most ethical person and all it takes is someone who's in power, who's, who sits in a position of power to make one wrong statement about me and that eviscerates my whole identity. So I, I do understand and I do feel you when you say it, it, it's a lot, it's a lot to carry. It really is. And just to, just to uh, th again, thank you, thank you for sharing. And I, I think what hopefully is important about this is, you know, for example, with the, with the good hair study, the fact that white women were explicitly stating that they didn't think that natural hair was professional suggests that we have no idea what it means to have to wake up in the morning and do that work. We just don't. We just see it as a hairstyle. And so part of the goal is, to, is essentially to lift up all of the work that it takes and all of the, so I'll give an example that, that um, is consistent. So a, a colleague of mine, a woman of color, described how when she goes to a nice store, 
first of all, she's always dressed perfectly. Second of all, she makes sure that her wallet and her phone are in a very uh, external place so that she never has to reach into her purse. And I was listening to all of this, and she said, you know, Rachel, the idea of having someone think that I have shoplifted, I can't take it. And so all of the thought that goes into preparing to go into a store because of the potential that someone will be following her and make this assumption about her. And again, this is where it's so interesting from a class perspective. You know, I'm the one who comes from the background that suggests all that should be true. She's not, and yet it's, it's our race that puts us in a different place. And so the work that, you, that, you, that you're describing and the risks that you experience, the rest of us have to hear that so that we can change the institution so you don't have to do the work. And I'll also add, we did a study this year, uh, our second volume of Science of Equality, focusing on gender. And one of the things that we realized was virtually, like probably 85 or so percent of the studies that so-called focused on gender only had white female participants. So when we think we're talking about gender, we can only be talking about gender if we have a representative sample of women of different races and ethnicities in the study. Then we're talking about gender. If we just have white women in the study, then we're doing a study about white women, which is fine. But let's say what we're doing. Because when we say these are gender stereotypes, oftentimes they're stereotypes about white women. And the stereotypes about black women that the two of you have just described are very, very different. And so, that's, so the intersectional work, we're all intersectional. It's not just some of us. So again, just to highlight the particular burden that black women bear because you're, you know, you're sort of confounded on both gender and a set of race norms, and that, that, that's bearing a lot. So thank you for sharing. So uh, I know we have two more. So I have a question about um, office culture. It's one thing to have a strategy for hiring that you um, put an emphasis on diversity. Um, retention often becomes a problem, uh, and we often hear examples of um, comments like you've heard today at the exit interview. Um, are, there, are there examples of offices uh, that encourage uh, communication around the office culture? And I'm sure you know, we've seen, like on college campuses, where there's an emphasis on diversity, often segregation occurs within, within, the, um, within the various classes. So when you're building on a diverse uh, a strategy for diverse hiring, can you perhaps give us some examples of offices that develop um, a good office culture by, um, by encouraging communication? Is it? So there's a, it's a wonderful question, and thank you. There's an enormous amount of work happening across, you know, sort of corporate as well, finally, uh, among you know, public interest and progressive organizations recognizing what was described in the room and what you described, that just inviting people into the door doesn't mean that you're creating a culture in which they, people are feeling equally valued. And so among, and, and you talked about one of, the, one of the issues being communication about race, and that's critical because again, what tends to be the, uh, there tend to be sort of a set of phenomena that are creating these kind of obstacles and challenges and burdens, as we've discussed, on colleagues of color that just, you know, the white, the white counterparts aren't even recognizing are occurring. And so among the issues that seem to arise that we hear most about, uh, we hear a great deal about the kind of social dynamics being, you know, tending toward whatever the dominant group is, if it's, if it's a very non, generally non-diverse culture with only a few people of color, uh, we, we sort of we hear about social dynamics, but even more importantly, what we hear is a lack of um, any way of e encouraging and recognizing excellence and really giving, again, mentoring in a real sense. That because what often seems to happen that, that, that we hear about in organizations that are predominantly white is, I think, and again, I think racial anxiety can help to explain a lot of this. If people are more comfortable uh, and sort of self conscious, if they're comfortable with people who are of their same group and self-conscious around people who are of groups that are not 
uh, that they're not their same group, then you're not going to have the sort of natural, hey, why don't you come with me to the trial and let's you know, analyze what's going well here. And hey, why don't, you know, I'd love to come and see you know, sort of your first X and give you some feedback. That doesn't happen naturally uncomfortably because there's often this anxiety. And so, what we're, so there's a couple things to do. One is uh, to create mechanisms where you're not just assuming that once you hire a few people, it's all fine. And that's, you know, lawyers, lawyers, you know, we hate icebreakers, you know, we hate retreats, we hate anything that we think is sort of cheesy attempts to get people to do things. But frankly, structured interactions across group are often really important because the informal ones are often so weird and awkward. Oh. And so, <laughs> just being honest. And so in some sense, what's, what's happening now, and there's some really wonderful uh, facilitators who we work with frequently, who create opportunities for people to have these structured interactions. And you know, there's a couple, there's some organizations that are creating, uh, having, having regular dialogues around issues of race that are facilitated and are structured and give people a chance to voice some of this in ways that then lead people to actually see each other and to be able to have the conversations. And when some, and I guess what, we, what so, so you've got the sort of what supervisors need to do and how to give feedback and how to mentor and how to really value their employees, that's crucial. What colleagues and what generally, frankly, the, the white people in the organization need to do is we've got to be mindful of, you know, mindful of the microaggressions, mindful of the ways that our biases or our anxieties might play out. And most importantly, if someone ever does us the great gift of letting us know we've said or done something that lands badly, we thank them. <laughs> We are grateful. We don't cry. <laughs> Serious. And we're really enthusiastic that the person gave us the gift of being honest. And this is something that I've said the crying part very intentionally because it's become evident in conversations that we have with lots of groups that, frankly, particularly people of my demographic, and I'm actually a big crier, so I get this. You know, we feel so awful that we've done something wrong, but if I then respond with my emotions, I'm making that person comfort me, which is what you described. And so being able to hear someone say, hey, you know, Rachel, when you said X, landed badly. Whenever I'm called on something like that, I'm so happy for multiple reasons. One is I know what I'll never do again. B, I know this is a person who, if I do say something that lands badly, will let me know. So if they're not, telling me that I'm doing something badly, I don't have to feel anxious. And so you can have the, you know, so you can have the, the authentic in, interactions without the wondering if I'm saying something weird. So creating cultures, and a lot of it has to do with those of us who are white getting a lot more muscle to handle some racial discomfort. Again, we heard our colleagues of color describe the work that goes into navigating the world, and we get all upset at the tiniest thing, frankly, having to do with race. And so that, that's, that's very much on us. So if you, can, if, you know, as the head of an office, which you are, if you can be the person who leads the way in thinking about what do supervisors need to do to make sure that the lawyers of color are getting all the opportunities for challenging projects and to you know, achieve excellence, to show their stuff, and getting the feedback that will allow them to do so. Um, and if you can also create some literally structured interactions for people to get to know each other where it's not just put everybody at a table and see what happens. Because yeah, we do sometimes then go to groups with whom we're familiar because on both sides, everyone's afraid that no one's going to like them or that there's going to be some awkwardness. So you may have to create uh, some opportunities that feel a little forced at the outset, but that actually once people flow into them can be really, uh, can, be, can be effective ways of getting people to actually know each other well. And so, you know, when we do these, when we do workshops that are longer and more involved, we actually do, you know, we have a game where you find someone and find the person with whom you're most different and you get the prize. Because we're often looking for sameness. You know, let's celebrate difference. So there's a whole host of ways to begin to alter office culture, to laugh more together, to, you know, kind of to eat more together, to sort of find ways where we can actually get to know each other in real ways. And it, it can really make a profound difference. And we've seen that happen. All right, I think my voice is about to go. So last question. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, I think this was very useful in terms of how to interact with clients. Mostly, unfortunately, I think it was catered toward uh, as a white lawyer, how to interact with clients rather, you know, I think uh, that was mentioned a little bit. Um, but it's very useful in terms of how to voir dire and not call out your potential jury about uh, their implicit bias, but uh, 
sort of empower them and strengthen their ability to recognize that they're being racist or recognize the, the dynamics of the interactions uh, between the client and police, all of that. Uh, but uh, something that, that I'm really interested in as a public defender who's mainly plea negotiating uh, and you know, trial is sexy, trial strategy is sexy, but a lot of our work is negotiations with DAs. And I think there's a lot of uh, strength in, in analyzing our perceptions and implicit bias in reference to how to best negotiate our clients' stories uh, and advocate for our clients. Uh, you know, the other day I had a, a white client who was in a fight with his white friend over video games, punched his friend in the face, and they're friends, and so it's a very specific scenario. But the white DA said, oh, that happened to me when I was in college. And so he's naturally, you know, sort of relating to this client in a way where the case is dropped. And yet with, you know, black youth who are... Uh, Identical scenario. Exactly, would it would not be the same outcome. And so I think it's important, uh, white attorneys, black attorneys, you know, I'll think of everybody, but um, specifically we have to consider who we are and how we can relate to the other side um, the other side meaning prosecutors, in trying to identify those aspects, even of uh, police interactions, you know, how many times have I had white domestic violence victim, uh, not victims, uh, domestic violence uh, cases in which neither party's arrested the first time police come uh, for white parties. And then black parties too, like black professionals, both parties are arrested because it doesn't matter you know, who did what, let's just arrest everybody, we'll figure it out later, who cares about more black people in the system? And there's all of these aspects of this work, um, so I'm going on and on, but. No, you're raising really powerful examples and virtually all of them fall within uh, what the social scientists would call in-group favoritism, right? Because every example you just gave had the person in the position of power, either the prosecutor or the police, essentially responding more leniently and being more willing to sort of give the benefit of the doubt to white people that they wouldn't give to black people. And likely, the reason that doesn't feel like racism to the prosecutor because they're thinking of themselves as just, you know, sort of, as you said, identifying with one group, they're not making the leap that they're not engaging in that same kind of identification with the other group, even though the, the, the behavior is identical. And so it's part of the reason that they don't feel like they're racist. And if you accuse them, quote unquote, of being racist, they'll you know, go into hyper defensive mode and it likely won't be fruitful. So again, part of the, in response to your question, similar to the response to the, to the question of, uh, of, of the woman in the back, I wish you knew everyone's name, is we are doing uh, work with prosecutors' offices precisely on that issue, and with judges as well, because judges and prosecutors do acknowledge when you, rate, when you lift this up, wow, I do respond differently to the 18-year-old you know, white guy who's about to go to college who's caught with some cocaine of a certain amount than I do with an identical African-American or Latino kid because I think of the white kid who reminds me of my nephew or my son. So they do acknowledge that, or the, 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 the white um, suburban a uh, woman who had too many lemon drops and she gets a DUI and they sort of like laugh it off and don't you know, respond the same way they would. So, so they do acknowledge that in-group favoritism and in some sense, part of what we're trying to do with them is to figure out mechanisms so that you can differentiate then between when is the in-group favoritism something that everyone should be accorded like I think we'd say, you know, every 18 year old who has a small amount of drugs shouldn't have their life completely derailed. But I think, I, I don't know about you guys, but I actually think DUIs have to be taken very seriously. And so there's a, there's a difference between those two. So we're, we are trying to do that work with them and they should be of course doing more of this. But in the meantime, what do you do? And right, like you, you can't count on them having done this work. So part of the question, part of the, the what you might be able to do effectively is to reframe as reframe what they're doing and try and use the lenience that they're giving to some group as a way of 
trying to benefit from that lenience for your clients in other instances, not by calling them racist for not doing it, but just saying, hey, you know, we're, here's how we're treating. And obviously, if you, the more data your organization is able to compile, so the more that you can accurately share what's happening in like cases, you can trigger that sort of sense of, hey, you know we want to be fair here. This is, what we, this is what's been happening with all five, of, you know, all whatever number of these cases that are identical to this. How can we justify treating this one differently, but in that positive invocation of positive aspirations way, as opposed to, you're a racist, how dare you treat my client this way? The problem, see, the problem with that okay. is that it can backfire. And that is to say, by you bringing to their attention the fact that they're leaning on one group can result in them being harsher on everybody. So that's an excellent point, and obviously we saw that with the, with, with, we saw that with the sentencing guidelines, right? Correct. So, and, and now with Sessions now going back to the old no, way. No, that fa fair point, and that's why I would, that, that's, ex this, this all has to obviously be sort of tested and worked through, and that's why in some sense the ideal would be to not make the case in a, to, to kind of make the positive case isn't it, you know, the, the way that we've been responding to these cases that leads to, you know, youths not having their lives disrupted or couples being able to go to anger management therapy rather than everyone going to jail and losing their jobs, it's been really effective. It's been really working. You know, isn't that the approach, like there's the positive way to make the case that, because you obviously, you're right, you, you don't want to risk the, let's just, ham you know, put the hammer down on everybody in instances in which that would be, again, systematically, d deeply harmful to everybody. So making that positive case, the hope would be, and this is all experimentation, but the, what the research does suggest is when people you know, sort of see themselves as behaving well, that can translate in a, in a positive way. So again, this is in some sense taking translations of the research and trying to apply it. But uh, what we're doing now in multi-systems work with you know, but in, 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 in Philly and in a couple of potential states, we're working simultaneously with prosecutors, judges, criminal defense lawyers, correctional officers, pro probation and parole, with the goal of having everyone on board to recognize when, you know, again, race is infusing the system in ways that are harmful. And so that's, I think, the, the, that's our best hope of not having that negative consequence that you describe be a result of trying to create fairness, which, which, which you identified. All right, I think I'm losing my voice. Thank you all so much.